uh, their offices. Um, many thanks to those of you who could join us here in soggy North Sydney this morning for our half yearly media briefing. Um, just the agenda this morning, uh, first up we'll have Inyaki will be giving you an overview of the company's performance for the first half and a little bit about what the future may hold for us. Uh, that'll be followed by Stuart Kelly, who is uh, Vodafone's Executive General Manager of Enterprise, and he'll give you a, uh, a look inside of the performance of uh, that part of our business. Um, and following those, um, those presentations, we will open the floor for questions. So with the questions we'll have from the floor first, then we'll open up the phone lines. Um, so anyway, here's Inyaki. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So, thanks for coming today. Uh, I think the purpose uh, of this meeting today is mostly to give you a view of where we are, uh, tell you also a bit about uh, plans. Uh, we're going to talk a bit our, about our network, our customer experience, some of the, the value that we give in our customers. And then, uh, definitely, we'll do some uh, QA, which is probably the Part that you are all waiting. So I will go through the presentation really quick. The first thing is to talk about uh, first half of the year. So like you know, we report uh, at the end of the year, but we did report our half year results about a month ago, and everything is good for us. So we reach five and a half million customers on our network. Um, I have to say that this has been a solid performance uh, year from many fronts. We, we are growing customers, we are growing revenues, we are growing output of these customers. Uh, the company is becoming more profitable. Uh, but also if you look at uh, other metrics, like what our customers are telling us about the service that they get from us, what is happening around TIO complaints in the market. So a lot of the things around our service are improving consistently. And I think that this is really what we want. We want a consistent growth, and this is what we are delivering. I was talking about the TIO complaints, and you know, sometimes I, I was asked, you know, why, why are you focusing on the, on the complaints? Well, the reality is that by looking at this indicator that is so visible in this market, we have been able to improve significantly the service that we provide to our customers. Not only we are better in taking care of our customer complaints when they have issues, but also we have minimized the chances for a customer to have a complaint. And as this was, uh, I think for the last four quarters, we are the lowest complaint uh, network operator in Australia. Uh, and also I think 3.8 is about half the industry average. Coming from where we were just two years ago, this has been a significant uh, achievement for the business. And this is on the back of a significant network investment but also around everything that has to do with our offer and the way that our call center in, uh, in Tasmania and the one we have in India as well is working with our customers. So a really company achievement. And that is what it means for our customers. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with MPS, Net Promoter Score, how much our, comp our customers recommend our business and this is uh, 17 points in one year. Uh, this is something that I have never seen. I've been working in this industry for many, 20, <laughs> almost 25 years. Um, but even on other industry, to do a 17 points growth on NPS is not something that happens all the time. And this is really uh, the promotion that our customers have of Vodafone. Something that we are also very proud of. And then, you know, why, why do we get all this? I think that, uh, you know, if you look at what we have been doing in the, in the last years, uh, on one side, we have a very strong network program, and we will talk a little bit about that later. Uh, we improve our uh, relation with the customers, customers significantly, a lot of focus around the customer care, and I talk about the metrics uh, around that. But also the other part where we have really changed uh, not just the life for our customers, but also in the market is around the value proposition uh, that mobile players are giving in this, in this market. 
I have three three things that we've been communicating uh, later. I'm going to start with the network. So you know, our network program is something that our customers are enjoying, but we are also making it very visible for other customers. This year, I don't know if you if you saw it, we did a stand with uh, with uh, Nova and with uh, Channel Seven uh, broadcasting their their uh, programs to our 4G network from many different parts of Australia as a testimony of our brand new 4G network that reaches 22 million Australians. And this is something that has really gone very well for us and is something that is attracting a lot of customers to, to our company. I think the other area going to Q1, uh, and this is, uh, this is our booming proposition, we, we have uh, enhanced the number of, of countries where you can, of, you can have a $5 roaming a day. This is a truly $5 roaming, it's no fine print. Your price plan in Australia, $5 on over 50 countries uh, around the world. Uh, and not only that, but in the beginning of, of the year, we did a partnership with Qantas for a lot of the travelers to, to enjoy this. And also what we did was with, with uh, the most traveled country by Australia, which is New Zealand, we even gave it uh, for free. So virtually we make New Zealand Another state of Australia, almost. I'm not like here, but please don't say that. <laughs> but anyways, New Zealand, like home, uh, what we did, and that is that's been also extremely popular because there is a lot of businesses, but also a lot of people that go to New Zealand of, with family or, or uh, also a lot of, of previous living in, in Australia. And then the last one is uh, is my mix. Again, I think that on the on the proposition to the customers, we've done. Uh, significant changes and if you go back I mean we eliminate we, we basically eliminated all the concept of ballers of you know this $60 plan where you get $700 of value that was really extremely difficult for customers to understand we went into unlimited calls and text uh, we put the $10 per gig on all our plans and now what we are doing is uh, allowing our customers really to create their own price plan so my mix is really a self-care product where customers are choosing, in this case, on a prepaid, you know, how much data they want, how many international minutes, how many minutes national, uh, and also how often do, do they want to, to top up. So they want a week, a week or four weeks, or they want to do a three month uh, plan. Extremely popular, uh, is now the most popular uh, prepaid plan on, on our base. And it's also something that we aim to do further announcements in the future. Uh, around this type of model where the customer has, you know, the ability to really customize what they are going to use from, from us. I think the other area where we've been uh, quite active is around uh, making this uh, a better market. I think that today, uh, just I issue a report acknowledging that there is a divide between, uh, it looks like they realize now that there is a divide between the services that Australians uh, enjoy in the cities versus what Australians can have uh, outside of these uh, cities. So I think it's good that after a few years of creating the, this problem, they acknowledge it. We have been working on, uh, on, uh, on USO and many other aspects of making two things. First, this is a more competitive market, but also uh, we have been advocating for using the public money that is going to make this a better market, especially on region Australia, to be used in a better way. I think that you know, a lot of, of the uh, a lot of the work that we did around USO and the need for for a reform, I think, has been uh, taken into account by now the Productivity Commission. I think there's been a very good responses, and we are quite happy that I think there will be a much better structure around how public money is being used uh, in this market to improve the overall infrastructure. I think the USO is also another example, oh, sorry, the, the black spot. Uh, and all in all, I think that not only we have contributed to the overall competitiveness of the Australian market by offering good value to our customers, but I also think that our public policy agenda is helping uh, this market to get even better. So I wanted to talk also about Probably the thing that has been more key to, uh, to the success of this business, and this is our network. A few weeks ago, we announced that Benoit Hansen, which is sitting here, and I'm going to ask him to stand up. 
not too much because then I look very small. But yeah, <laughs> 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 okay, okay, so I'll, I'll go like that. <laughs> so uh, Benoit has been with us for three and a half years. I think he's been uh, not just responsible of uh, of a lot of this transformation around the network, but the other thing that I really appreciate that Benoit has done is is leave a legacy uh, of, of a team that is now going to take over and bring this network even, even uh, forward. So Kevin Milroy is now uh, taking over uh, Benoit until we do a, you know, a, an announcement of, official announcement of who will be the CTO, but uh, Kevin is, is really taking over. And the whole team that Benoit has been working for three and a half years and making this significant change on the network, a network that is new. 4,000 sites have been upgraded, renovated. Uh, there is about 750 new sites uh, built in this period. Uh, we farm of the spectrum, 22 million uh, people under Vodafone 4G uh, network coverage. Um, you know, we started with with, uh, with a refarm of uh, 850, bringing 850 into 4G, which was a significant step uh, and it, in a way it, it kickstarted the race to reach more and more uh, customers with 4G for all the players and uh, this, this uh, refarming has continued but also, not only that I think that you know the core upgrade that enables us to offer almost 1 million customers are now on Vodafone using voice over MP. Um, the project that we launched uh, around a year and a half ago uh, with, uh, with TPG to, uh, to reach most of our an, uh, antennas with, with the fiber and enables us to get ready for 5G. I think that all this happened under the leadership of Benoit. We cannot say where Benoit is going because that's the role of someone else. But, uh, but I think that you know because of all the good work that he's been doing here, I think that uh, he had a lot of opportunities uh, given and I think that I'm really grateful of of Benan and now with Kevin, we hope to continue all this uh, journey. Thank you very much, right, Benan. Okay. Um, so this network is not just uh, recognized by us. We are very proud of it, and we always talk about our network because not only we have invested a lot of money in it, our customers enjoy it every day. They use more and more data every day. Uh, our customer data usage is over three gigs per month per customer, and this is about 70% growth year on year, uh, so a significant part of, of, of the growth of this business. But if you look at um, this report uh, by OpenSignal, this is actually a crowdsourced uh, report where OpenSignal gets the experience of many customers on multiple operators and they, they are able to penetrate the network. This is reality. This is crowdsourcing, this is not what we say, it's not advertising, this is open signal. And uh, we, again, are very proud that uh, Vodafone is number one in three of the categories. And, you know, I think that is a testimony of the value that our customers are getting. So I can tell you that it's the best bank for the back in Australia by far. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, one of the right reasons. So as I said, you know, now we are gearing up for 5G. Uh, I, I believe at the end of this year, Kevin will be uh, demonstrating, uh, Kevin Milro will be demonstrating a 5G uh, demo on, uh, on our network. Uh, we will also be looking into narrowband IoT. IoT is an important part of our business, an important part of Vodafone business worldwide. Uh, Vodafone Group is, is the, the biggest machine-to-machine uh, -machine, uh, provider in, uh, in the world, and that is why we are also looking at this technology to enhance our services uh, in Australia. And I think that, you know, five years, again, we are we're just finished with our 4G deployment. We are already talking about 5G, but this is how fast the technology goes, and also how, how committed we are to, uh, to this, to this, uh, to this network. All this stuff that we do is we do it because we have 
amazing employees, and for that reason, we are also investing a lot on uh, on uh, on ourselves, on our company, and, and one of the targets that we have is to also become uh, the best employer in, in this country as uh, as Vodafone. Um, this year, we had a graduate program where we had 2,000 applicants. We were really overwhelmed by the, you know, really how many people want to join us and be part of this project. And that is something that we are extremely proud of and something where we are also investing a lot, not just investing in our network. And also one of the things that we will be doing is um, in the next weeks, we will be moving to a new building in Sydney where we can put all our people in a new facility with a collaborative environment, open plan, it's in Pacific uh, Highway 177. For those of you that want to live out here, you can go and take a look. It really looks fantastic. And we will all be working there, uh, as I say, in a, in, a few, in a few weeks. Lastly, let me talk about another thing that we are extremely uh, proud of and another thing that we've been working in this half of the year, and this is our foundation. And one of the key projects has been our collaboration with the Garden Institute uh, on, on, uh, on an application that has really helped uh, this institute uh, accelerate their, uh, can their cancer research. So Dream Labs, which has had already about 60,000 downloads, is basically converting a lot of idle phones uh, that are just recharging on the, on the side table of the bed into a supercomputer, uh, providing this computing job. People are, our customers are basically donating computing power while they sleep and helping uh, cancer research. And this is also something that we are very proud, not only because of the impact that is having in, in Garvan in Australia, but also because we have been able to convince a lot of other companies in Vodafone Group, and it will be, uh, it will be installed also in New Zealand, UK, and many other countries coming forward. And that's it. I'm going to leave you now with uh, Stuart to talk a little bit about our enterprise success since uh, last June and also with some of the plans with enterprise. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Stuart Kelly, and I'm the Executive General Manager of Enterprise Business uh, here at Vodafone Australia. Uh, and Aki has talked to uh, I suppose the consumer success and the network success we've had over the last 12 months. So what I wanted to do this morning is talk a bit more about enterprise business and what we've achieved over the last 12 months since our re-entry uh, into the enterprise market in Australia. Uh, when we came back into the market, we made a decision to put four pillars in place, which are coverage, care, choice, and capability. And we've put all those as our, our bottom, our foundations of the pillars as we move forward. And over the last 12 months, we've had tremendous success based upon that. So if I look at some of the, the numbers that we have and some of the success that we've had, I can get this to turn, there we go, fantastic. Uh, if I look at the success that we have from a customer growth standpoint, uh, customer growth has gone five times market rate uh, in the enterprise market that we've experienced so far. We've had a number of significant major wins with Qantas, for example, being one of our largest wins, and additional wins in the uh, utilities, in automotive, and also in the healthcare sector. We've expanded our sales presence quite significantly. Uh, we've put in place a direct sales team that we now actually plan to grow fourfold over the coming six months. Uh, we have 350 business specialists now at 400 retail locations uh, nationwide. We've also launched five Vodafone business centers that are nationwide uh, based as well. From a sales and service standpoint, we have 120 dedicated care agents looking after the enterprise business based down in Hobart. And they make a significant difference to what we do from a care standpoint that we look after an enterprise business in the Australian market. From an NPS standpoint, we've also seen a, a large growth. We're up four points in the first half of this year. And since we've relaunched, we're actually up 14 points in total. So fantastic achievement by the team, the results that we're astounded by, and it's really a result of the demand for both of back into this market. Uh, as we move forward, we look at the, the growth and how do we keep going from strength to strength in the Australian market. Uh, from our standpoint, it's absolutely critical to keep moving forward from a partnership standpoint and also from a product standpoint. In January, we launched with uh, Qantas Acquire, which is the, the business points program that Qantas has. We remain partnered with Cosboa, which is the Council of Small Business of Australia, and we've launched new products as well. We've launched from a tariff standpoint, we've launched Business Flex. Uh, business Flex gives 
customers with 10 subscriber loans are more the opportunity to tailor the tariffs they require based upon the usage and the needs of the, the customers and the business that they have. Secondly, we've launched uh, Vodafone Ready Business Apps. And this is our first steps to becoming a whole business provider in the Australian market. When we look at the, the apps that we have in market today, uh, we have the following. We've got Dropbox for business, we've got Office 365, we've got Google Apps for business, Norton Security, and GoDaddy from a web hosting standpoint. In addition to this, we also launched the Ready Business Indicator, which gives our customers the opportunity to benchmark themselves from a technological standpoint, see how fit they are for purpose in comparison to other customers and other businesses in their sectors. We've had a phenomenal take of customers who are exploring that and using that. Uh, as we move forward, we continue our focus uh, very much on customer care and customer focus. Uh, I've stated already that anybody on the Vodafone uh, enterprise business space that has 10 subscriber lines or more, they automatically are given a dedicated name telephone account manager to deal with their enterprise business needs. In addition to that, we utilize the network guarantee, which has been a fantastic success in talking and engaging with enterprise businesses uh, within the Australian market. We stand over our network, uh, and actually talked about the incredible job that Ben Warren and his team have done over the last three years, and it makes my role so much easier to be able to go out to a customer and stand over the guarantee of our network. And we believe it's right for purpose, we believe it works for you, and the success we've had in that has been fantastic over the last 12 months. If I look at the group leverage, how does Vodafone accelerate in what we're doing? Uh, we leverage Vodafone Group. Worldwide, Vodafone is a leader in enterprise business. They've got the expertise from a product standpoint, from a capability standpoint, and from a people standpoint, and we make sure we tap into that group uh, purpose as much as we can to get our success driving faster and harder. Within the Australian market, from my standpoint, I think it's very clear to see the telco landscape has changed dramatically since Vodafone has re-entered. There's no doubt of that. Our competitors have reacted. They've looked at their pricing, they've looked at their services, and they've looked at the offers they're giving to their marketplace. From our view, Vodafone is driving competition in small business and medium-sized business in Australia, and definitely Australian business is a better place uh, for us being here. If I just go on a little bit further, uh, and I talked about uh, IoT. Uh, today, as you know, we launch our Internet of Things barometer, and we've quite a few of our team here today uh, to assist us in this. Um, worldwide, um, both of them are the leaders when it comes to IoT. The Australian market, from an IoT standpoint, is expected to go beyond $1 billion in revenues by 2021. Worldwide, there'll be 20 billion devices connected to the Internet based upon IoT by 2021 as well. Uh, and Aki made the point that we're at the early stages of IoT, but the network team are laying the foundations for us to lead the market in this space. Again, worldwide Vodafone Group are the number one players when it comes to M2M and IoT, and we need to take that capability and bring it into the Australian market. IoT, as we said, is becoming increasingly important, but when you look at the readiness of business within the Australian market, it differs greatly. One such example that we've done already, which is a trial which is first of its kind in the Australian market, is with Southeast Water uh, in Victoria. We started a trial uh, on water metering, looking at the management uh, of the water pipes, the sewage pipes, from an access and a maintenance standpoint. Uh, phase one of that trial is coming to a conclusion. Phase two will shortly commence, where we're going to roll out an extra 20 sites and 300 devices within Q4, and then make the decision with SEW of Southeast Water uh, in the next year, F117, and how we accelerate that further and go through all of Victoria. When we talk to the, the Vodafone uh, IoT parameter, which everyone is going to get a copy of this morning, uh, we'll provide you with a detailed copy. But, but the barometer is actually a worldwide survey that's concluded from 1,086 executives worldwide, giving their thoughts, their views, and their inputs on IoT, what it means for their business today, and more importantly, what it means for enterprise business moving forward, and how we're able to assist in that standpoint. Interestingly enough, this is the first time that Australia has actually been included uh, in the IoT barometer survey. So the insights we get this year are actually even better, because we're able to look at Australia, see how we benchmark from an Australian standpoint, uh, from an IoT in comparison to the world, but also from an APAC standpoint. The general consensus we get is IoT is critical to business solutions. I think it's fair to say it's a new industrial revolution. It's going to change the way we work and the way that we live and the way we service our customers. In the report, it was interesting that 78% of Australian businesses, they stated critical to the success of their business and their industry. And IoT is now being used in everything from smart metering, uh, remote monitoring, smart, midis, smart cities, and healthcare. But interestingly enough, half of Australian businesses, they plan to deploy IoT connectivity in F117. 
So when we compare Australia, and we look at Australia and see how do we compare globally and also to APAC, the findings actually aren't great from an Australian standpoint. What we found is that Australia is lagging behind APAC, and we need to delve further to understand why that is the case. One of the key reasons we face is from a security standpoint, Australian businesses, in excess of 50% of them, believe that we are not prepared from a process standpoint to manage the security requirements of IoT. So work has to be done in that space. When you compare that to Asia Pac, and you look at Singapore and you look at Hong Kong, 75% of customers uh, that are in this survey state that they are absolutely ready today. So APAC is charging ahead, and we need to get up to the game from an Australian standpoint. One of the other things we need to look at is the expertise. When we look at IoT within Australia, there's definitely a shortage of expertise in IoT. And it's a big feedback from uh, the survey that we have. Most customers, when they're surveyed, believe there is expertise out there, but internally, they don't have the expertise to manage the requirements of IoT internally. And they're looking for organizations such as Vodafone are able to globally bring that together into one to help them on their journey as they move forward. So finally, the barometer report's available for you all today. Uh, the link is on our, our website, and we have copies of it uh, outside here today, so you'll all get a copy as you leave uh, later on this morning. So with that, I'll hand over to Anaki, and we'll talk about the future. Thank you. So I think that uh, just to wrap up and before we go into the Q and A, a bit of what's coming. I think that the first thing is, you know, we, we continue to see a solid growth trend. Uh, actually, July was our best commercial month ever. Uh, so we continue to perform well, and I think that on the back of customers seeing Vodafone as a as a as a good as a good partner for their mobile. Uh, communication needs, I think that that is uh, something that we see extending during the, the rest of the year. Network evolution is still a big part of, uh, of our next six months, uh, and we continue these investments uh, further next year, but this year we still have uh, quite a bit of work to be done around many of the topics that we discussed uh, before, and also maybe Benoit and Kevin can elaborate a little bit more into, into what's coming. Uh, on customer experience, uh, you know we are we are very happy with the results so far. We still think we can do much better. Uh, I think on not only on TIO but also on customer advocacy, we, we want to continue working on on this front. And then I think that also the choice and uh, personalization that I was talking about. Uh, so what you have seen on my mix on prepaid is something that, as I said before, we will be communicating uh, more options and more chances for our customers to, to continue. The other thing that I didn't put here, but we are also working is, uh, I think that now we've seen the MBN reaching uh, a number of households. I think they are now close to 1 million premises, and they have announced uh, close to 5 million by the end of next year. And this is also another area that we are looking uh, very closely, and we are uh, investing a lot of time and effort in understanding uh, whether this is something that we want to go in uh, in the future and how to do it in a way uh, that we can provide some value to our customers. So definitely a lot of opportunities moving forward uh, and uh, backed by this strong performance of the company in the last years and our good network, we are really encouraged to continue this, uh, this journey. Thank you very much, and I'm going to invite uh, my colleagues, Benoit, Kevin, uh, to come here for Q&A, or you want to do the introduction? Or? No, that's no, okay. We'll just uh, start, we'll take the question from the floor first, and the drops out of the blocks. Um, hi, it's Petrox from Communi uh, Communications Day. Probably this is for Inyaki. Um, on the fixed side of things, the MBN has got a million connections now. That means roughly 10% of its market is gone. How? Um, the same question that I asked Victoria Palau in February. How long can you afford to wait and investigate before it becomes too late to grab substantial market share? Also, Victoria mentioned in February that you might look at start in fixed from the enterprise SME end. Is that still on the table? I mean, all those, all those are. I think that you know. Obviously, since Vittorio said that, we have been working a lot on, uh, on this. Um, I think that 10% of households is probably not uh, yet the volume of, uh, of uh, 
premises that I think that we 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 think is is uh, is viable, but definitely five million it is, and uh, definitely what we are considering is what we don't want is to be just another one. I think that that is not really a good opportunity. It's more about you know how can we do something more for for our customers, and that is really what we are. We have time. Uh, also, I think the way that the model has been created in, in Australia is is not a very difficult entrance. Uh, we have a significant customer base, and that is really the, the aim of our right? But I think in the past, MBM was something more, you know, futuristic, and I think that now is is getting closer for us to a deeper look into and, and probably you know, consider how we can really leverage on that. Stuart Corner, Freelance. Mm -hmm. uh, can you just go back then onto that slide where you had the, the accolades for various parameters and you, you made some comments as it was disappearing about coverage. Um, I'm just not just sure what that was showing because obviously the one area where Vodafone is still behind Telstra is in coverage. And uh, the one thing you didn't you didn't say um, is what your plans are to continue to increase coverage as a percentage of the population, as a percentage of the, of the land mass. And I wonder if you could comment on that. It's clear that Telstra has uh, more coverage, especially mm -hmm. in rural uh, Australia. Mm -hmm. That is where there is a difference, and I think that that is acknowledged. Mm -hmm. I also think that that is part of the problem that the, the own uh, digital divide uh, report that Telstra has published I think, today or yesterday talks about. It. I think that the, what we aim is uh, to reach more Australians as possible because we believe in competition. So the way that you're going to get a uh, bridge between this divide is the only way is by creating more competition. I think that there is, we want to reach more places, and that is why we have invested significantly on our own network, on black spots, but we are also looking at other opportunities to, uh, to improve uh, our coverage in these uh, more remote areas. How would you do that? As I said, there are many ways, so one of them is investing. Uh, yeah, other than investing. Uh, yeah. Roaming, some sort of roaming green. That we already have a roaming agreement and we are also looking into those type of uh, arrangements because we believe that there is, you know, any type of network share like you can see in any other country. If you go to Canada, the US, uh, New Zealand, uh, that is the way that areas with very low density are being reached by multiple providers. That is a model that works in many countries. Yeah. It doesn't work here. Yeah. Do you actually have a, an agreement to roaming from the network? Sorry? Oh, yeah, the that you had an agreement with the network. Network. Sorry? An agreement with Optus to run with network. Oh, yeah, with their uh, that cover? Uh, the Optus network. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> I wasn't aware of that. Okay. <laughs> so uh, uh, it, it covers a little bit more than the Vodafone home network. Mm. We've been in that arrangement since 2013. Mm. Okay. So still, still in um, But just to your point, uh, coverage. Th this is actually a measure that uh, is. is oh, uh, it's uh, it's mentioned here as availability, but it, it basically translates to coverage. Um, I want to put a few words to why are we coming out equal to Telstra mm. uh, effectively, because this is actually measured from how customers perceive it. So it's an app that's loaded on their phone and measures signal strength and, and how uh, how that particular handset is perceiving the network. And what it also says is that. Oh, the, the, the background of this is that we are still enjoying today the advantage of the low band 850 LTE network. Mm. Um, now, technically, the network, the 700 low band network of Telstra, if you have a phone that supports it, technically it's, you'll get the same outcome. Mm. But because many more, many more customers have 850 capable phones, if you look at the total customer experience of the whole base, mm. we are we are still enjoying an advantage uh, uh, there over the the uh, 700 networks because the penetration of phones is a lot lower. Right. So yeah, so you take a 700 phone and compare it to an 850 phone, you'll get the same outcome. Yeah. Mm. But because many more people have 850 phones, the overall experience you get something like that, and we compensate the lack in regional okay. with a better 850 experience. Hi, Samir Chopper from Bank of America. 
no relate. I had um, two questions. One is, you know, the, you mentioned that there's 550 sites which have been wired up. Uh, I was wondering if you could give some color around how quickly you got to that, uh, and, and is that the TPG arrangement? That is, that is the TPG number. Yes. So we, we have many more sites uh, uh, on on fiber, uh, but this is the number that matches to the TPG, the new fiber number. And then the second one was... Um, and, that, and that's the number today, so... Yep. <coughs> the other one was just in terms of um, the 700 megahertz uh, spectrum that you're looking to acquire. What's kind of the timelines with the regular? When do they make their decisions? How long does this take? So we, so we made the... Uh, we submit the proposal to the government um, around April, March. Uh, so before the elections, uh, in that proposal, we basically, uh, what we suggested the government is for us to buy uh, some spectrum uh, at the same rate that the spectrum was auctioned two years ago. So the same money that Optus and Tastra paid for 700, we also brought, uh, proposed the government to do that. Then the elections came, now there is a good government, it's a new government, so I think that we are just waiting for, uh, for an answer from them. So there is, there is really, Time frame is set by, by the minister. The minister makes the decision, or is it A Triple C? I think this is a ministerial decision. Yeah. So it's not an A Triple C. This is between ACMA and the minister. Um, Max Mason from AFR. Um, just on fixed again, are you looking at organic expansion or acquisition, or is everything sort of open at the moment? Everything is open. Uh, but uh, basically what we are looking is at the different opportunities in the market. But I think there is, I think the MBN is, is a significant part of that. Uh, there are other great opportunities, so we are looking at the board spending. Hi, Alex, it's uh, Roy from IT Wire and Comswire. If everything is open, and if you want to like, you know, smash Telstra and offer much better coverage and service and speed, then why am I not hearing about you guys investigating Artemis networks and their B-cells, which they announced a couple of years ago as mobile fiber, delivering 5G on today's 4G phones, using software-defined networks to deliver coverage through interference, which normally would cripple a network, but in this case to deliver what they claim is the maximum speed of the connection, depending on your backhaul, obviously. And, <coughs> you know, this technology was um, been looked at by Nokia for the last year. They're putting into Levi Stadiums. They're using five megahertz of dish spectrum network in San Francisco to build a network. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm just shocked I don't hear the world's telcos or operators talking about it. Maybe they're scared of it or something. And we're talking about 5G in 2020, you know, trials this year, trials next year. The standard's not finished yet. We have someone who claims that they've got a solution today. Why the heck is no one installing it? Why aren't you, why aren't you guys doing it? Don't you want to beat Telstra at the game? I think you said it yourself, uh, they claim. But have, I mean, have you, <coughs> the question is, have you investigated their claims? It's been two years that it's been on the market. And if it, if it, if it really does work, why aren't you doing a trial? Uh, we, we, we look at many uh, technologies and we scan the market, uh, uh, including the technology that you refer to. Sure, sure. Um, I think for special purposes, and the purposes that you actually mentioned, uh, it provides, uh, I think, a niche very niche solution. Um, I don't think it's suitable technology for network-wide deployment of the kind that we do. And certainly the lack of standardization. Standardization is at the core of our business. Without the standards, the mobile phones talk, don't talk to the network. Without the standards, our network doesn't interact. When you want to make a call to Telstra or Optus, it doesn't interconnect, it doesn't roam. So the standards for our industry are extremely important. And Lay the foundation for how, uh, yeah, people around the world use technology. So if, if it is non-standard, uh, yeah, for us that's a big. Hurdle. I mean, but you know, from what they claim again, what, you know, I've never seen the technology. I only see their videos and the reports. But they claim that they can deliver um, onto 4G LTE devices today with their software-defined networks. And I mean, I don't know if that's the case. But if if they are wiring up San Francisco, as they say, well, that's not a, that's not niche. I mean, that's San Francisco, so look, we've yet to see, but I would just be very sad in a couple of years to find out that Nokia or somebody else is deploying this widely, and you guys, and Australia's missing out. That's it. We'll see in five years. Yeah, we'll see. Thanks. 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 Thanks.
right. <coughs> Congratulations on winning the Quanta account. Um, but maybe you could walk us through what got Qantas across the line, what was good about the Vodafone proposal, what, what sort of worked? Yeah, the, the, the deal. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Qantas, uh, fantastic. We, um, we start migrating the Qantas fleet over oh, probably about four or five months ago at this stage. We've pretty much done most of it. Uh, there's still a little bit more to do in some of the regional locations. Uh, that includes all the voice connections and also the tablets as well, uh, which engineers are using for uh, managing and maintaining the things we all fly in. Uh, we've had a great relationship with them. The, the brand name is a great one to be associated to. I think it's two great organizations together. Uh, but certainly the experience so far with Qantas has been exceptional. It's, it's been really good. They're very happy with what we've done. And now we continue to roll out the fleet with them. Was this, did they come to you because of a global relationship? Was it something locally that you did? I think, I mean, this, we, we started this discussion probably a year ago, and it was on the back of our roaming proposition. And, you know, Quantas is, a, is also a company that is looking at travelers and is, is, is you know, making like, you know, service uh, for, for these people. And we are also providing the best communication service for travelers. I mean, we have a doubt. So I think that there was a pretty uh, clear uh, opportunity to join both things, and that's how uh, it came together. And you know, then we, you know, we became part of the of the loyalty plan, and, and also what they decided to uh, be part of the, the account to us. Uh, maybe just to add to that point as well, uh, because they are a global organization, as we are as well. Uh, Vodafone Global Enterprise will also look at Qantas in other locations where they fly to, so we do work with them in the UK as well to see how the service that treats them. Um, Kevin, congratulations on taking over the uh, Atlantic memoir. Um, can you tell us a bit more about these five new trials and um, which vendors you're working with? Because right now you guys have what, uh, Huawei and NSM in the radio and also Ericsson Core. Um, yeah, so if, uh, I think as Nyaki said earlier on, that this is, you know, we're going to get our first groups of this towards the uh, back end of this year. In, um, Trial system. We're working you know, with a number of our uh, partners at the moment, um, so th there's not going to be any announcement as to who who uh, we're working with. But um, you know, it will be our first uh, first opportunity to sort of see and, and, and experience what a customer will will get with you know, a 5G offering. But it will be sort of the first glimpse of it. You know, the, the, the actual network will not really be until 2020, and um, I think as in the markets. Uh, said as well, you know, we still got a 4G network that I'm sure uh, uh, continues to deliver a great service that, that, that it has been right through that period of time. So it'll be our first glimpse at the end of, uh, end of this year. We're working with a number of suppliers and um, come 2020 we'll be ready for it. 2020 is the span, but would you consider doing any kind of pre-standard elevation work on 5G, depending on the trials? I think, <laughs> I, I, think I would refer to Inyarkins to... Uh, that's the same answer that I gave the gentleman. Uh, our industry depends on standards uh, and standardization. So uh, for us uh, in Australia, I think we'll be very early out with a standardized 5G offering, but it will be standardized. So I would, uh, Alec. Sorry. Hi, it's Alec. Just, just on what you were just talking about, are these um, lab trials or are these going to be on the production network? Uh, no, no, it'll be, it'll be a lab trial. Okay. That's all. Is that is it going to replicate what um, Vodafone did in the UK with Huawei? Uh, I'm, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not familiar with what Huawei have done with the UK, so uh, I, I wouldn't comment on that. It'll be our own lab trial. Okay, we've got to take sorry, it's your, yes. we'll come back. We want to take a couple of questions from okay. the phones first. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question and answer session will be conducted electronically. If you would like to ask a question, please do so by pressing the star key followed by the digit one on your touchstone telephone. We will proceed in the order which you signal us and we'll take as many questions as time permits. If you're using a speakerphone, please be sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Once again, please press star one on your touchstone telephone to ask a question. Our first question comes from the line of Raymond Tong from Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Good morning, guys. Um, just had a couple of questions. Um, 
And now, if you may, maybe can you make a comment on um, sort of the, the CapEx outlook for, for Vodafone, just, um, just given, I, I suppose, both your main competitors, Telstra and Optus, uh, sort of signalled sort of uh, further CapEx hikes across the next couple of years. Um, that, that's the first one. I didn't understand the question, sorry. Oh, no, I'm just wondering um, how, how do you see the CapEx outlook for Vodafone, just given, um, I suppose, both Telstra and Optus uh, increasingly investing in the network um, over the next two to three years? Yeah, I think that uh, if you look at the... I think that, you know, there has been a continuous talk about the amount of CapEx that each uh, uh, player is putting in the market. We, you know, we've been doing high teams uh, as a... As a as a capex intensity, and that's our aim is to continue in this market on that range uh, for the foreseeable future. So basically, we continue on the on a similar level of, of investment that we've had in the in the past years. Okay, great. And and, sorry. and uh, just a second question, just in the enterprise side of things. Um, um, it's sort of mentioned that you're winning share. Can you give a um, sense of who who you won the Qantas? Uh, uh, deal from um, who the existing carrier was, and, and, and also just um, giving you targets and where you think you can get your market share to. Yeah, the uh, Qantas was an interesting one. Though. They they had a mixed fleet. Uh, they have gone through Telstra, but also Optus, uh, based around the, the service they're providing uh, in Australia. So thankfully now there'll be a Vodafone fleet uh, as well. Our, our plan is to complete with them. Uh, I didn't quite catch the second part of your question. Uh, just um, can you give a sense of what sort of market share you, you, you're sort of holding at the moment in enterprise, and where, where do you think you can get to? Yeah, we, we, I don't think we uh, we, we share we that. Uh, uh, but our market share in enterprise is also is, is an area of growth. We basically restarted enterprise uh, in July last year. Uh, so what I can tell you is that the the highest growth of, of the company, and it will continue for a while because the appetite in the market is. There is a huge opportunity for us. There's a huge opportunity for customers to have a, an alternative to their, to their supplier, especially on the small and medium enterprise that are, is a segment that has traditionally been left a little bit uh, uh, alone. So I think that that is that is uh, that is our aim is to continue growing mainly on those two uh, segments. Great. And, and do you think a fixed line um, sort of offering is important? Um, to, to, to sort of uh, enable greater market share in, in enterprise? Yeah, it's quite interesting in enterprise at the moment. A lot of the, the key decision makers in larger organizations are beginning to split out uh, fixed data versus mobile, which, which I think is a sign that people are waiting to see what's happening in the market at the moment. Uh, in the place that we're playing today, which is uh, small to medium sized uh, organizations and mid-market, uh, we're moving very fast with mobile voice, mobile data and IoT. It's not a hindrance to us uh, in any way, shape, or form. But I think uh, to Anaki's point earlier, even when uh, that should become available to us, uh, obviously a greater share of market will become also open to uh, Vodafone. Okay, thanks very much. Our next question comes from the line of Suprapim Adhikari from the Australian. Your line is open, please go ahead. Thank you. Hi. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Hi. Uh, look, I had a question on the enterprise side as well. Um, look, uh, given that you said it's a high growth area for Vodafone, uh, is there a possibility you may look to acquire uh, businesses, uh, local businesses that can help you target the enterprise market, you know, like integrators or solutions providers? Uh, the immediate answer is no. Uh, we're doing our growth through partnerships. So if we look at the people we partner with today, uh, obviously through the applications we talk to, we have very strong relationships with people such as Office 365, uh, Google Apps, uh, Dropbox, uh, etc. We also work very closely with Huawei and therefore work with a lot of their SIs and system integrators and uh, so on. So for our standpoint, growth for us right now is through partnership. Uh, we continue to do that and we're getting good success from taking that approach. Okay, thank you. Once again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone. Our next question comes from the line of Claire Rayleigh from CNET. Your line is open, please go ahead. 
Thanks for taking my question. Look, um, I, I have a question around your competition in the consumer space in mobile. We saw some large profile outages um, the, from one of your main competitors, Telstra, in the first half of the year. Um, do you think you adequately capitalised on the potential for people, disgruntled customers wanting to leave Telstra and you potentially being able to take a massive sweep of new customers coming over to Vodafone? Uh, so, I think that what we are doing is working on our network and offering a good service. The way we capitalize is because, you know, more customers are coming to us. I don't know how much the network outages have impacted Telstra versus what would have been without those network outages. I think that that's more a question for them. But as I said before, we are very happy with our uh, commercial performance uh, in terms of customers, in terms of ARPU, and also in terms of how the company is is uh, is evolving. I think that you know customer numbers in this industry uh, is a very tricky number. I've been twenty some years working, as I said before, and everybody reports different numbers of customers. Sometimes they include the machine to machine. Sometimes they don't include the machine to machine. Sometimes they include the minos. Sometimes they don't include the minos. It's a little bit tricky. I look more into our performance. Is good. We get in good customers coming from Telstra. Good customers coming from Optus. And that's our aim. And so just in terms of, I guess, you, the numbers can be hard to track, but your place in terms of the consumer mindset, I mean, we think about telco, people can really become entangled with their telco, they become lazy, they don't want to change, it's hard to change your plan, but these were really, really high profile outages that might have annoyed people enough to switch. Do you think you really grabbed, grabbed your share of the buy there with people who might have been struggled enough to switch? I mean, I think at the end of the day, what, what is happening is that uh, people in the Australian market are realizing that there are alternatives to their traditional telco, and that's what's happening. And you look at in the churn that has been reported by, by our competitors as well. So that is, I think, the indicator. If you want to look at one indicator, look at that. Um, so yeah, I think that is, is, uh, is, is a market where the level of investment is high in all the three players. And probably the claim differentiation is not so real, uh, and that is what is bringing uh, many customers uh, to come to work from. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Ian Martin from New Street Research. Your line is open, please go ahead. Oh, good morning. Uh, I'm going to decide to talk about the ACCC market study and the competition issues. The ACCC recently cut uh, regional transmission pricing by 78%. I wonder what else you're looking for uh, from the ACCC, and in particular, uh, you know, Rod Simmons has asked recently about whether the Commission might consider a declaration inquiry on mobile. I just wonder where Vodafone stands on that issue. Well, first, uh, you know, we are really welcoming the, the ACCC uh, acknowledging that there is a need to review the market. I think that that, in essence, is, is something that we've been uh, asking for for some time. I think the ACCC last year decided to take action around the transmission. And transmission has been, over the years, uh, I think a big barrier for investment in regional Australia because uh, given that the only provider of fixed infrastructure was charging uh, quite high uh, prices, it was very difficult for anybody to make a, a decent business be able to, to offer competition. I think that ACCC saw that, they acknowledged it, they, they, uh, they instructed to, to reduce that. And I think that now the fact that they are continuing to look into this um, situation uh, of the market because it is an evident that, it is evident that in this market, you know, if you live in a city, you can have plenty of choice, but there are places in Australia where you don't have choice. I think that it is good that ACCC is looking into that, and we welcome any type of measures, recommendations, but also incentives for the industry to talk to each other and, uh, and fix this, uh, this situation uh, for the future. Australia is a, is a market, it's a country that has low density in many areas, and I think that is really good, not just that the ACCC and uh, other institutions look into solutions, but also that the industry talks to each other to see how we can leverage better our infrastructures uh, to offer better services. 
so you, your preference would be infrastructure, some kind of infrastructure sharing arrangements rather than necessarily a, a declaration? I think that we have uh, many, I mean, I think there are many different solutions. Uh, you know, if you look at what is happening in other countries, I think the infrastructure uh, sharing is the is the most common uh, solution in, in many different forms. I mean, whether it's a co-investment or whether it's national roaming or different ways, uh, ultimately, to, uh, to be able to share a single infrastructure for multiple retailers. Thanks, Tarantis. Okay, we've got time for one more question from the panelists. It appears that there is no further question at this time. I will now hand the call over back to all the speakers for any additional or closing remarks. Okay, thank you. Uh, time for last questions. <coughs> I'll just keep it quick because I'm sure Petra's got a more interesting question. But uh, with the uh, five dollars a day, when do you think you might expand it to more countries and get more of those countries onto uh, 4G? So as we as we speak, we are doing that actually. Uh, we just approved uh, inclusion of uh, new countries into the offer, so we are doing both things. As as we can, uh, as fast as we can, uh, open uh, 4G in in our roaming agreements, we are doing that. And the other thing that we are doing is also talking to many countries to get this type of uh, of deal signed, so we can include them uh, in the plan. Our aim would be, you know, is always to grow this uh, this proposition because you know for for a lot of for a lot of people, the ability to use their phone whenever they travel in, without having to come back and face a you know thousand dollar bill, it, it is really a lot of value, and, and we think it's, a, it's it's one of our key propositions. Uh, the GSA came out with a white paper a couple of weeks ago saying they expected to see LT networks, commercial LT networks, at uh, uh, one gig very soon. I forget the exact date, the time frame. Uh, do you have any intention to to offer one gig on your LT network, and if so, what sort of time frame? Uh, technically, our network can do one gig today, so um, uh, we we shape up the network uh, to the demand that we have. So it's not something that we now have commercially deployed. But from a technical perspective, the technology on our site, on our network, is there today. Mm -hmm. oh, when, when, when the customers see that. When, whenever the customer demand is there. It will, uh, it, will be, uh, it will be activated. It needs to be commercially sound. Yeah, there are also no devices. Yeah. There's no devices. Yeah. So it, it, it's always what we can do today is in a, in a by combining devices, we'll, we can create the demand. As we said earlier, we've done we've done quite high performing. Uh, we call it stunts. I'm uh, with with uh, with Nova and uh, Channel Seven. Mm -hmm. And these kind of transmissions require really high performance, and mm -hmm. we haven't had a a hiccup, so that works pretty good. <laughs> that works pretty good, it's really the... <laughs> <laughs> That's the headline. <laughs> uh, Inyaki, just a follow-up on Ian Martin's question, really. Um, the comms minister, Mitch Fifield, has been pretty quiet on mobile apart from the Black Spots program. You've been quite energetic in talking to Canberra and the minister um, around 700, of course, also yeah. around things like USO reform. What's your sense in terms of the kind of policy appetite to uh, to look into mobile competition, particularly in the region? Uh, I, have, uh, I think that um, I think the appetite is there. Uh, not so much about. I, th I think the appetite is not about the competition. I think the appetite is more around uh, you know government and, and many institutions realizing that there is a gap uh, in the kind of services that many Australians have today. And I think that there is a really good intentions around, you know, improving that situation. And that situation is not just about mobile. I think that it goes beyond mobile, and also because the technologies are becoming so linked, uh, I think it's, it's much broader. And I think that the government is under a genuine uh, intention to really improve this. Uh, mobile competition is definitely part of that, uh, and you know. I think that is, is just usually what happens in, in, in fast moving technology sectors is that you know you are asking a lot from the legislators and governments to keep up to speed on everything that is happening, but I do think that the intentions are there. Hi guys, um, Alvin from Telsite. Um, in the last 12 months, we have seen increasing investment and partnerships around media content from your competitors. Are you able to talk a little bit more on um, what, what are those doing on that? 
So our, uh, I mean, around media, we've done, we've done. Uh, actually, it was, I think we were the first ones to offer uh, Spotify in the market. Uh, we also had pharmacy with Stan, uh, and we are, you know, it is part of of, uh, of the thing that we look at and how we can provide good value to, to customers of that. So I think our competitors are are looking much more into the content. I think on the Netflix side that they are on the mobile, but they are also doing things on the mobile, and I think it's becoming. Uh, Hi, yeah, Alex from ITY and Cosway with one more question. In the US, you've got T-Mobile uh, and Sprint both offering unlimited plans. Obviously, they're not unlimited for data. T-Mobile is 26 gig before they'll shape you. Uh, Sprint is um, 23 gig and even Boost Mobile, owned by Sprint, nothing to do with Australia, is offering a $50 a month US unlimited plan too. So when do you think we might see these sorts of Unlimited with limits plans for um, for data uh, in Australia, which um, theoretically, given the small population and the incredible efficiency of you know, one gigabit capable networks, could be switched on, you know, theoretically today, but obviously not yet. So my view on this, you know, it's always risky to give a futuristic view, but I think that you know, unlimited and mobile is not something that goes well, you mm -hmm. know, because the spectrum is is, is limited. Which is why they're putting hard limits yeah. on so in the States. So that is why a lot of companies are working around, you know, how do you make an unlimited that is not really unlimited. I mean, it's marketing. <laughs> and that has some issues. I think that there is, though, a trend around offering unlimited services. And I do think that there is an opportunity around that. And you see how, you know, T-Mobile in the US has done certain, you know, few things there. And, and you see some announcement there. And I think that probably things will go that way. But a truly unlimited all you can need on mobile, uh, I think is pretty difficult when you have limited spectrum. Sure, I mean, it comes down to shaping and uh, being able to give enough, 23 or 26 gig for most users is enough. And then, you know, if you, if you give them, if you don't put them on edge speeds or something, then it's still gonna be okay for general surfing. Yeah, and I mean, if you look at our plans today, I mean, most of our customers are buying plans that are very close to 10 gigs. Mm. And 10 gigs a month on a on a mobile on a mobile service is is really pretty rich. I mean, you can do your video on the train. You can do pretty much all the social networking. You can do your emails. You can do a lot of stuff. And uh, so I think that there is a you know definitely a race to, to offer all the capabilities that we are building to a customer. But to go into a service where a customer can use a tera, terabyte. Uh, I think that you know it's probably we'll show you. limited with, with the way that the spectrum is, is arranged. Okay, one last question. So, do you see Vodafone being an acquirer of content rather than just partnerships, especially when you move into this? That is another question that uh, I think that content is extremely expensive and it's extremely difficult to monetize it unless you create it. That's my view. Now, what we will do in the future, I don't know. We'll have to see because this depends. But in, in principle, I think that the agreements that we have done are more sensible around partnering with people that create good content and then, uh, and then be able to offer that content to customers that just buy rights uh, with a very uh, difficult financial return. And if you are, you know, you are putting your money there, then you're probably not putting it in other places for the customer. Subsidizing content, you know, are we network operators, and that is a really the, the challenge. But this is, if you look at the money that some, not just in Australia, you know, worldwide, some operators are paying for football and all that. I mean, uh, the CEO of Vodafone says that it's really good for Ferrari. Players buy a lot of Ferrari, <laughs> but, but that is that is a, that is the challenge. I think I, I like more the the partnering. And to, to really have good content partners and be able to offer that content to the customer. I think it works better because also gives the customer the freedom of choice. Once you link the ownership of content to get your customers in a way ransom, I think that that in the long run has problems. Okay, well, uh, I'll need to pull stamps on this. Thanks very much, everybody, for. Uh uh, coming out this horrible weather and thanks for those who joined us on the phone and I'm sure those who are here in North Sydney want to have a little chat with the, the executives here, I'm sure they'll have a
Thank you. Thank you.